Um, as a very quick introduction then, um, you saw the slides, we could talk about them another time, but um, uh, Fran is, um, let me just go back to that then. Our, our speaker today, Fran, has many years experience as an ELT author, test writer, teacher, and trainer. She holds a PGCE and MSc TEFL from Aston University and has worked in Europe, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia as a teacher and trainer for the British Council and International House, as well as providing in-house teaching and teacher training on and tutoring on CELTA and DELTA courses prior to COVID, Fran taught at Reading University, developing language and methodology skills of Chinese primary and secondary school teachers of English. Um, Fran, it's a delight to have you here today. Um, uh, over to you. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I saw some of you writing in the chat, hello, hello. <laughs> um, and let's start. I hope you can all see this. Right. Okay, so... A, a, a grey box over some of it. Yeah, that's gone now. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me know if anything isn't clear. So today we're looking at progressing intermediate students um, upwards. So I hope this gives you some um, practical ideas and some food for thought. Um, let's begin. This is what the session aims to do. And first of all, just to think about this reason for the intermediate plateau, <laughs> is it real or imagined? Um, and for me, um, some of the issues involved are related to our approach to language, okay? Basically, um, we approach language in a grammatical way. I'll just let you read these two little points here. Because we still need, we still um, rely very heavily on grammar to frame our courses, um, to frame our teaching, um, it means um, that the learner's progress is often measured in terms of grammar by us and by them. Um, so <laughs> this might not be the ideal way to do it in some ways. I'm just raising questions here. Um, and given that syllabuses often revolve around, gra around grammar, Assessment is also frequently largely grammar based. OK, now you might think, why am I talking about grammar here in this session? Um, well. I think grammar is important. It's important to look at this because it um, it tells us a lot about why we have this intermediate plateau. Um, why do we zone in on grammar so much? There are. There's lots of reasons. Grammar makes sense of patterns in language. And for many learners, it's invaluable to give them these footholds. It gives us a way in to the apparent chaos and enormity of learning a language. And it makes assessment easier and fairer um, because it's focusing on small, on discrete, specific items of language. OK, um, this is grammar giving us a sort of pathway through the jungle that is language. <laughs> this is the way I like to see it. And this is why we love grammar, okay? And it's why learners love grammar and what, why historically we approach language in this way. Grammar can also feel incremental, okay? I've done this, now I'm gonna take the next step, so I'm moving upwards, okay? Now, if you look at this, this is interesting. Um, bearing in mind that a lot of what we spend time on is grammar in the classroom. Look at this pre-intermediate. This is the, um, the front page, the index page of a pre-intermediate course book. And this is an upper intermediate course book. I'd say the vast majority, two thirds of it was tense based. OK, and look at these. These are all, except for the green, these are the same. OK, plus these extra bits at the bottom that weren't verb tenses. OK, so this is just to bring home the fact that we are spending a lot of time on grammar. We're making our learners believe that, of course, grammar is important, which it is. But they're doing the same grammar over and over again over a long period of time. So therefore, it's no wonder in some ways that learners start to feel as if they've hit a plateau. This leads on to motivation, okay? 
let me read let, let I'll let you read this on your own okay maybe you've got some extra ones to add Okay, so lots of different reasons that motivation might slip at this intermediate level. Various reasons. They, they feel that they've done it already because of the grammar situation we've talked about. They're still frustrated. The novelty's worn off. Ho-hum. So there's lots of different reasons. And I kind of see it like this. When you start building a house, just as when you start learning the language, the first few stages feel very visible. You quickly feel you're making a lot of progress. Um, and the end product, or when you get to a much higher level of English, you can feel that you can communicate in most situations, you can read loads, you understand some of the radio and the TV, but the middle bit is kind of fuzzy, okay? Um, and that's that, that intermediate kind of level. Okay, so I thought it would be helpful to actually look at what the difference is between these two levels. And one way of doing this is to look at a reading text, okay? So before we actually listen to a reading, I'm going to let you, sorry, before we before we actually do a reading, I'm gonna get you listen or watch a video. So Adam, would you mind sharing the video of this B1 level Museum of Failure? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'd just like you to watch. This is one of the videos from um, Sensations, and it's about a, muse a museum which has opened in New York, um, which is about all failed objects. Okay, that's just to put you in the picture. And we're going to look at this a bit later as well. But for now, just enjoy it and find out about this museum. Joanna Goodman has put on an art exhibition called the Museum of Failure in Washington, D.C. The Museum of Failure intends to start conversations about the importance of failure. The products that we are saying that their failures are, are subjective, uh, debatable, but it is about that conversation. Uh, so we are sort of having fun with it. We want to take away the stigma from it. So I think the fun factor makes it much more attractive to people. The Museum of Failure exhibition first opened in 2017 in Sweden. It displays the failed products and inventions of successful companies from around the world, but mainly from the US. Some of the big names include Starbucks and Oreo. Starbucks attempted to sell coffee mixed with olive oil, which upset customers' tummies. One Trump-themed Monopoly board game resulted in low sales, as it was too complex. Meanwhile, Oreo's unusual new flavors turned customers off. I've heard that one of the most disgusting that's not featured here is the um, barbecue chicken wings. It's uh, rather vile. Thank you, Adam. I think that's enough. Thank you. So I just wanted to give you a taste of what you'll be um, looking at. Now, question before we look, what we're going to do is to look at, um, at two texts at B1 plus level and at B1 pre intermediate level. So what I'd like you to do is just to do this task in red. What for you makes a B1 pre reading text different from a B1 plus text? So can you think of some ideas that for you make the level difference? Okay, so you can think in terms of grammar or lexis, complexity, syntax. Can you just think for a couple of minutes and maybe if you have any ideas, put them in the chat. If you've got any ideas, just pop them in the chat and we'll see 
what you think is different. So what makes a pre-intermediate text different from a B1 plus text? Any ideas? Think in terms of the lexis, in terms of the syntax, in terms of the complexity. I'll tell you what then, I'll show you an example. I'll show you the example. If I can move the thing on. Oh, we've got an option there. I'll let I'll, I'll move on and let you just there we go. Thank you. That thank you, whoever's written something. I'll show you here. The pre one is on the left. This is the first part of the video you've just seen. OK, and this is the B1 plus on the right. And I've included the numbers of words per sentence. OK, so have a look at these these um this extract. And as a teacher and as a semi a linguist, <laughs> um, what do you think? makes this, the one on the right more difficult. And pop any ideas you have in the chat. Yeah, vocabulary, there's vocabulary differences, definitely. Brand, your your um, chat box is a grey square over part of the screen. Could you move it to the side because we can't read anything? Oh, so sorry. Thank you. Anything else that makes those two? Oh, yeah, we've got passive and active voice. Yeah. Have a look at the length of the sentences as well. Any other differences? Let's just have one more, go on, what other difference? Complex sentences, relative clauses, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. exactly. Here's one I did earlier. <laughs> so um, you can see that there's different kind of lexis. Here we have opened. Here we have put on, um, phrasing like saying customers the toilet, <laughs> upset customers, tummies. Yeah, we've got things like much longer noun phrases, the exhibition versus the Museum of Failure exhibition. OK, um, and then we've got things like Trump's Monopoly game, whereas Trump themed Monopoly board game. So much, much longer noun phrases. We've also got um, things like the green, we've got uh, a more complex sentence, um, and we've also got these discoursal blue words as well. And we've also got a bit of extra information in pink. Okay, so there are some obvious differences. And if you look at the word, the sentence length, you'll notice that the sentences tend to be much longer at the, um, at the B1 plus level, okay? Um, so lots of things happening which make a text um, harder as they move up the levels. Um, so I thought that would be interesting just to have a look at that reading. I, th I think it can help us as teachers to be more aware of where we're trying to get learners to. OK. OK. So we're going to look now at some practical ideas of how to stretch, stretch and challenge intermediate learners. Okay, and I've divided this next part into two parts. Okay, the first part is just um, some, sorry, it's just some quick ideas about vocabulary and phonology. Okay, and the second part is some ideas that you can use at whole text level. Okay, why do we use to, why do we need to use reading texts? Well, for this reason, and particularly at B1 level, they're very, very useful. For me as a teacher, I use so many texts in my classrooms, be they video or articles or whatever. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a bit of analysis. And this is what I do with my learners after reading a text, I get them to look much more closely. These are just um, three ideas, easy to prep, <laughs> which is important, vocabulary exercises. And we're using the video lesson that you've just seen part of. Okay. 
The first idea, again, I, I expect some of those will be semi-familiar to you, is simply find the synonym for. Okay, so you're doing a vocab exercise, you're getting them to extend their vocab. Um, I've given you four examples, famous large companies, organized and tried. Okay, answer famous, successful, or you could give the last letter. Large and important companies, big names, organize an exhibition, put on, tried, attempt. Okay, for differentiation, include the first or last letter, letter, in other words, for learners who might need a bit more support. Okay, and you can also put them in the order of the text that they appear. Okay, and that helps them. That's the first idea. The second idea is good old collocations. So get students to match the two parts of your collocations. I plucked a few out um, from that single text. There are so many. And then students categorize depending on the word class like this. OK, so they match the blue and the, the red, the blue and the brown. So art exhibition, olive oil, upset your stomach. After doing that, they then can check with the text. Then they categorize them into word class. And then you can remove the text as an extension and get them to write about the text and they have to use at least five of those collocations. Okay, and then the third idea from the same text is this kind of basic transformation exercise, which I do a lot of because I find that at this level, learners often get verb patterns wrong. Verb patterns are nice because they cross grammar, syntax and lexis. So it's a really nice thing to focus on and make students that they feel that they're really developing. OK, so you give a sentence which is not the same as the text and they have to rewrite it with the word from the text. OK, or you could do it the other way around. All right. Um, so it was too complicated. So they had low sales. It resulted in low sales. Visitors can share their failures. Visitors are encouraged to share their failures and so on, okay? Then learners return to the original or they use a dictionary to check the verb patterns, which is a very, or online, um, which is a very common problem at B1 level. And as I said, if necessary, you could do it the other way around. So if necessary, make up sentences based on the text content, um, which is the same idea, but they would then wouldn't be able to check with the original text. OK, this is what I, I do a lot of when I'm teaching this kind of level and also higher. I do quite a lot of it at B2 and C1 level as well. OK, moving on to pronunciation. OK, again, three ideas, quick ideas. Um, and I know that some of you will be familiar with these. First of all, take a bunch of those lovely words that you've had in your text. This was from um, the text that we've just looked at. OK, and then they have to, you know what they have to do. They have to pop them into the correct boxes. Um, and then the, you can do a quick exercise with them. You drill them. They do the ba 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 or the ba 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 game to their partner, where their partner has to identify the ba ba ba, which one it is. For example, ba ba ba, invention or disgusting. Yeah. Um, and then as an extension at this level, you can get learners to come up with some of the rules. For example, nouns ending in I-O-N, for example, invention, exhibition, it's the penultimate syllable that gets stressed, typically um, with verbs with two syllables, typically, not always, it's um, bom bom, it's on the second syllable, produce, inspire, okay, upset his stomach, right. Second idea, linking phrases. OK, sorry to be talking at you here. I've got to, lots to get through, but I will let you talk very quickly. Um, at this, what you do, first of all, is you can, as a leading, get think of the questions for three for three of the below. Either you give it to them or either you ask the questions and they try to give you the answers in, an, in a hope that they will elicit these answers. Or simply you give them these words, these collocations or phrases. Um, and they have to think of the questions just as a little bit of extra task. And then you, you give them these phrases. 
they say them in pairs to each other, what happens to the words in blue? Some lovely consonant vowel linking, an art exhibition. Okay, and a coffee mix with olive oil, olive oil resulted in low sales, resulted in, okay, share their experience. That's an intrusive R there. Okay, so this kind of lovely stuff, which actually I find a lot of learners like if they're hoping they're aiming for a, a native English speaker um, speech, not necessarily an elf speech. <laughs> um, and this is a really nice way to extend your activity. And of course, by getting them to focus on these lovely words and to say them, I think it helps those collocations and phrases to go in. Yeah. Um, so it's a way of really helping to shift that, that language that they're exposed to, to become part of their repertoire. Okay. And for those of you who've, um, who looked at my other webinar on the tonic, OK, this is an extension of that. You give them little phrases or um, you give them little phrases from the piece that they are familiar with and they have to highlight what they think is the tonic in each phase. So here will probably be failure, opened or possibly the, the year, Sweden, displays, etc. And then they could check with the original and maybe discuss what, what the difference is. OK, for this one, they need to know the context very clearly um, to understand where to put the tonic syllable. Okie dokie. So three quick ideas to get them really picking, picking out bits from the text and peering with their magnifying glass. These ones aren't about meaning. OK, these these ones aren't about meaning. These are phonology, um, phonology based. But I think it helps to make them feel that they're learning something and to shift them forward. OK, and just bearing in mind that all those phonology and um, also the lexical, the, the vocab ideas, they would have to come after comprehension. So first of all, they would read the text, they'd digest it, have one or two comprehension tasks, and then you'd zoom, or zoom in on these little tasks. OK. Moving on. Now, this is perhaps the more, more interesting bit. This is the one I feel um, quite passionately about. Um, and I hope that comes across. Moving from a discrete item to moving from those little areas to a more holistic approach. And I think this is really useful for intermediate learners. OK, um, so we've just done some of this and now we're moving to look at the whole picture but then we're gonna break it down and build it up again. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. Okay, and this time we're going to use this video. Adam, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing this one, this is your task here, listen and find out more about jackfruit, which are these massive, these colossal fruits. What's so good about jackfruit? Okay, maybe you know this already, but it's a nice video to watch anyway. Green and spiky, with a strong sweet smell, jackfruit has become the latest superfood. It's been part of the South Asian diet for centuries. It grows so abundantly that tons of it would go to waste every year. But now India, the world's biggest producer of jackfruit, is cashing in on its popularity. Jackfruit is a superfood meat alternative. Chefs love it for its versatility. When ripe, it can be used to make cakes, juices, ice cream and crisps. When unripe, it can be added to curries, fried, minced or sautéed. In the West, it's used for burgers, tacos and even cutlets. But it's not just vegans and vegetarians who love it. Apparently, even meat eaters can't get enough of it. And its health benefits are only just being investigated. James Giuseppe is the founder of Jackfruit 365, which produces jackfruit flour. Jackfruit is one of the most under-researched superfoods in the world. Nobody has paid attention to jackfruit. So, for example, 30 gram of jackfruit flour has one gram of pectin. That is the equivalent of three apples. An apple a day keeps doctor away because of pectin. 
I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Did you all learn something about jackfruit and what it, why it's good for you? I, I won't get you to type your answers in there, but um, I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, so. So the first idea, and again, just like the um, pronunciation and the vocabulary ideas, do this after any comprehension task so that they understand the, the meaning of the text, okay, as a whole. Um, so translation. Okay, and what you do, so you I've put on an extract here. You, you, you usually can't do the whole lot unless it's a very short text. So you might give this length of text to your students, maybe say you have to do at least the first two, okay, so others can extend it. And they then have to translate. They have to translate those sentences into their first language. Okay, why don't you have a go? That's your task. Translate the first two bullet points into your L1, into your, your mother tongue or another language. Keep it as close to the original as you can. Don't miss out any info. Okay, can you do that now? I'll just give you two minutes. Do the first two bullet points if you can. Give you one more minute. Okay, don't worry, as long as you've done at least the first one. Okay, and then what happens next, do you think? <laughs> okay, we've done step one, okay, which you could do depending on your class, if you're a monolingual class or if you've got people with the same first language. You could put them in pairs to do that translation. That's And then you do step two. Okay, they compare their version with the peers, maybe another couple. You're monitoring. You put anything of interest on the board if you're in a monolingual classroom and if you notice their, uh, if you know their first language. But keep stage two relatively quick. Okay, it's the later stages which are the most interesting. Step three, remove the original text. Step four, learners then rewrite in English the text, the few sentences that they've done. And then later they compare with the original and you can discuss alternatives. I hope that's clear. So basically they've translated the piece from English into their first language, then you remove the text and they translate it back into English and then you compare with the original and you discuss the differences that they have in a in a plenary session which is important that discussion is interesting an interesting one and it can raise lots of really valuable points okay that's the first idea okay um I didn't I should silly me sorry I meant to actually get you to translate it back <laughs> to put it back into English. I'm so sorry, I forgot that stage. Um, okay, sorry, the next step, the next um, task that we're going to look at, which is at discourse level, is text rebuilding. So with this one, you provide, you've done this in advance, the prompts of the main content words. The content words are likely to be nouns, verbs, adjectives, key adverbials, just like this. And you as much as possible, you just use dashes, maybe abbreviations, um, because you don't want to give them too many words. Um, and then again, what do they have to do? They have to build it back up. Now, occasionally you get a bright spark of a student who will just have memorized first sentence. Yeah. Um, but if they've done that with the first sentence, they can't usually do it for the later ones. <laughs> um, yeah. OK, mix your students up carefully so that you have different levels maybe working together. Um, and again, you monitor as they're working. It can be very, very telling. OK, now this reminds me of the dictogloss technique. I don't know if you're familiar with that, which is um, an oral like a dictation. And then students have to write down their own prompts 
um, and then they build it up again. It's quite a similar idea. It's also a little bit similar to my, um, if you went to my session on retelling, it's a little bit similar, but of course, because you're dealing with reading to writing, it has to be much more accurate, okay? Um, so maybe you want to have a go with this one. Why don't you have a go with these first two sentences? If you've got a pen and paper um, or on your computer screen or phone, why don't you just have a go at this first and possibly the second and third sentences? I'll just give you one minute. If you don't even write it, just do it in your head. Okie dokie. And let's go back then to look at the left hand. This is the left one here. This was the original. I hope yours was fairly close to it, the green one. <laughs> and when you're going around monitoring or when you pull it together in the plenary session, this is the really interesting stage where you can look at contrasts. Okay, what have they written and what was the original? Are they the same? Are they different? OK, this was one student's version. The one on the right in the cream is the student's version. So just have a quick look at how they compare. So what's really interesting here is, again, when you not only have they done this hard work and they've processed, you can really see them processing that language they, when they compose their version. But when they go back to the original, of course, the original becomes much more salient to them. So they will notice things like, look at this last sentence, that the fourth bullet point, chefs love it for its versatility. This student and others wrote something like this. They love jackfruit because it is very versatile. OK, so it really makes them focus on the differences. Very similar meaning, but different phrasing. OK. Um, if you look at also the phrase before, now India has become the biggest producer of jackfruit and it is cashing in. OK, so they use the and to join those two together. In the original, they had um, they had this between commas as extra information. By now, India, comma the world's biggest producer of jackfruit is cashing in. Okay, and when we looked at this example together in the plenary, I was able to actually pop this in to sort of scaffold as well. I, I said, you could also put this in and I also provided them this word. So it's kind of scaffolding for them. And this technique is perfect for allowing that kind of, um, that kind of input. And I think students are really ready. We're talking about fruit, but I feel they're really ripe <laughs> to take that extra information in. And that teaching is really likely to become learning. OK, third idea. OK, this is tech. This is another uh, sort of rebuilding idea. Um, we won't listen to this text, actually. Um, but this one is basically about the British Museum theft. It's a recent piece. It was in September. Um, and I don't know if you know this story, but basically um, the British Museum discovered that thousands, literally thousands of its very precious ancient pieces had been stolen from the archives. Um, and that's basically what the piece was about. These pieces had gone missing over years and years. They'd had warning, but hadn't done anything about it. OK, so that's the story in brief. Um, and this is what we did there. OK, this is the first part of B2. So I've given you a high level just to 
um, do give you another example. So have a read. Okay. And with this one, again, it's a similar idea of sort of breaking it down, building it up. Um, of course, you get them to read or listen for comprehension. On the sensation side, this is an article, it's not a video. Okay, so they digest the text for comprehension. And then we can do this. Okay, so they, you look at sentence one. Okay, this is at B2 level, remember. And then what they have to do is they have to break it down either individually on pairs into as many separate facts as they can. OK, so number one, some artifacts were stolen. They were taken from the British Museum. There were about 2000 pieces. Now people have questions. They're asking if the security systems are any good and so on. You might do this for five or six sentences, have a minimum, and then the stronger, quicker students can do extra. Same here. You'll have to give them a couple of examples if they haven't done this task to um, this sort of task before. Okay, you could even do them as a whole class. Okay, if it's the first time you're doing this task type. Okay, so why don't you have a go? This is the third one, third and fourth sentences. Do you want to have a quick go, either in your head or on the computer or on a piece of paper? Break those down, those two sentences down to as many separate factual sentences as you can. shouldn't have any buts or ands or becauses in there. They should be separate sentences. Okay, and what do you reckon happens next? Okay, you can type in the chat. I want just to check that you're still with me and you haven't fallen asleep. What happens next, do you think? Any ideas? What's the next stage? Bearing in mind what we did with the two previous activities. Yay, reconstruction. We are <laughs> Exactly. You get your students to reconstruct it. Um, so they build it back up. And this is what my student did. This one, this one um, was actually a one-to-one -one student. So we did that together. She was from Brazil. She loved this activity. I have it really, really pushed her. Um, and this is what I found. I find when students do this activity, all these reconstruction activities, it really makes them process language at the next level. Um, Okie dokie. And then I did this with another group, a small group, Japanese, um, and this was the B1 version. And the blue is what we looked at in the plenary. OK, so I added this. I felt some of them were half trying to say it or I felt it was just appropriate to pop it in. So I was scaffolding. I added this extra information as optional. So you'll see here where it says the British Museum was built in 1753 and it has eight million artefacts. I added this as a non-defining relative clause. OK, and then I said, oh, I tried to elicit. We got there in the end. Um, as a participle clause. So you just delete the which was between commas. And there you go, you've got a really sophisticated sentence which you've constructed together. Okay, this student was, she looked at the B1 plus, but she is actually more of a B, she's nearly a, a B2 kind of level. Okay. Um, so, okay, so there's your 
three ideas just with that last one this is what we what how you do it basically on a worksheet or on the board or iwb the interactive whiteboard or a screen you having read the text you put maybe the first um the first one or two paragraphs depending on the group <clears throat> Then you break it down. So the green sentences go with this one. The blue sentences go with the second one. OK, you can either do that together or in small groups. Again, they need to be familiar with the task. Of they need to have examples. And then you remove the original and you reconstruct the text collaboratively. So this is really important that you do this in pairs if you can, if they're not a one on one student, because and this is why I love this, these activities you can see them discussing language. So they're kind of saying, no, no, I think um, I think we need the passive. Oh, we need the which there. We can put a comma. You know, you can see them reworking it in their heads and it going deeper into their um, intake. <laughs> um, it's, it, I, it's, it's wonderful in that respect. I'm not saying that maybe not all students might like it, but I, in my experience, most students at this level and above like it. Um, they enjoy it and I think it's really, really worthwhile. Okie dokie. So why are they valid? Okay, this is why I think they're valid. <laughs> they're content rich. They know what the texts are about already, so the focus shifts. Yeah. That's, yeah, I'm just reading your nice comments in the chat. Thank you. Um, the content is understood and it lessens the cognitive load. So they're allowed, they can at this point in the lesson, having digested the text, they can start to focus on how the text is written. Okay. It's also a way of consolidating reading, reading and deepening understanding it because they're converting it to a different skill. You're getting them to look really, really closely under the magnifying glass at those sentences. This is the one that's particularly relevant to this se session. It stretches learners beyond merely noticing to production, thereby pushing them to the next level. I'm not saying they're going to achieve something and then always have it because that's not how learning happens. But, you know, if you've encouraged them, let's say, to produce a non-defining relative clause in a natural context, in a natural way, they're therefore, they've at least partially understood that. OK, it's collaborative because they're discussing alternatives. We've got different skills going on, reading, writing and speaking. Processing of the language is maximizing, you're decoding and encoding it. So you're breaking it down and building it up. And learners are required to process multiple aspects. So it might be discoursal, it might be syntax. You know, if you think of word order, stuff like that. Um, and there's obviously grammar and vocabulary going in there as well. There's lots of different things. Some students might take on some and not others. Okay, but they they seem to all get something from it. And they also provide opportunities for emerging language and for scaffolding, possibly from their peers, certainly from you, either when you're monitoring or when you're um, when you do the cleaner at the end. OK. And learners find them motivating and challenging. OK, and the final thing to note is that these sorts of tasks aren't in course books because they're hard to work in a course book. They're unwieldy. So that's. Just because they're not in course books doesn't mean that they don't they don't work and they're not very valid. They're very valid, but it would be hard to put them in a course book. I think you can see why. OK, just tips and considerations. Just have a quick read through of those on your own. If anybody has any questions about those, you can just put them in the chat if anything's not clear.
Okay, so just read the first point. I'll just comment on these. Read the first point. Obviously, when we when we give them a reading task, usually it's kind of plus one. Okay, so it tends to be above their level. But we're asking them to reproduce this reading task. So so if anything goes slightly below, okay. Um, I like this task because it's very easy to differentiate between stronger and weaker students. Um, so I think, you know, if you just say, I want you to do this with five sentences, um, the first five sentences, and then the stronger students can do extra, okay. I think this is also important, present these reconstructions as a challenge or a puzzle, yeah. Um, that's the way I present them to my students, and they seem to relish that channel challenge, you know, let's see if you can build this up again, yeah. But at the same time, emphasize that they don't have to get it as close to the original as possible. That's not really the aim. They have to have the same content, but the way they do it could differ. Okay. And we've mentioned scaffolding. I think um, if you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, it's really easy to handle, but as a group, it's probably, you can monitor and feed in bits of language as you're monitoring, or maybe their peers can do that if they've got stronger peers. Um, but you know, pull out useful examples, maybe take a couple, one, a couple of examples and put them on the board and just look at how that could be even more improved. Yeah. So we're getting to the end now. Um, okay, just one or two extra thoughts. I, ha um, I don't think that you could challenge me. I am not an expert younger learner teacher. Um, I don't think these tasks are likely to work with young children um, because of the nature of the tasks. You know, it's in a way it is, um, it's partly language for language's sake, um, but that's meant in a positive way. It's analysis of language. So you need to have those metacognitive skills. Um, I, think, I think children could do it with, from prompts, for example, they're probably not gonna be talking about language, but they could just do what sounds right. So it's kind of, um, it's almost they're just choosing what language will sound right without having to analyze. So they could do it at a different level of analysis. Um, don't overuse this, okay? If they know they're gonna have to break it down and build it up all the time, it's gonna lose its sparkle. <laughs> and just as a little extra, um, like something like a dictation, <laughs> however old fashioned it sounds, these activities are really useful to assess learners on their writing. Um, so it's actually a very handy skill in that respect as well. It's a handy task. Okie dokie. I don't think we're gonna do this one. I've got an extra idea, which is slightly separate, but we won't do that one um, because we don't have time. So if you want to know any more, you can have a look at the recording. And just to finish off with, um, just, I, I have kept this theory brief. Um, but basically, the, where I've got to this point in this love of reconstruction activities in particular and, and this need to sort of try and move our intermediate learners forward is through interest in different areas. One of them is this declarative and procedural knowledge. So this idea of two different knowledges, knowing, um, knowing facts, for example, I know that's the past simple, um, I know that's the present perfect and I know why we use it, okay? And procedural knowledge is, you know, for example, being able to drive a car, yeah, um, having a skill, but without necessarily being able to analyze exactly how you know it, okay? And the, the kind of things that we've been looking at today, for me really, it, it touches on those two important types of knowledge. Um, that's one area. I'm also very interested in emergent language and um, the probably teachers, but not necessarily, it could be a peer, this idea of scaffolding and recasting language as the students need it, because I think that's really useful. And it's partly also because I realized that when I learn a language, that's how I li like to learn. Okay, so you're not learning because the teachers decided you're going to learn present perfect or whatever today but it, you, a need for the present perfect, let's say, emerges and your teacher, your scaffolder, pops it in. And you think, oh, I think I get that. 
Yeah, it's emergent language. Acquisition versus learning. So this is a bit related to the above two. Um, what is acquisition and what is learning and how do you blend the two? Some people in language acquisition, second language acquisition, call that the interface position. Input versus output, the value of the latter. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but um, this basically what, what re many researchers have found over the years is that you actually um, learn by speaking or writing. You actually learn language that way as well, being pushed. And I think that's what our, our tasks today in the second part have been looking at. Okay, and processing grammar, this idea of noticing things, then structuring them, making input into intake, and then proceduralizing. Um, I will give you um, the references if you're if anybody's interested in this. Okay, and this idea of structural, i.e., grammatical versus process syllabuses. Um, again, that has kind of affected how I I think and how I value these activities that we've done today. A process syllabus being something like a project based or a task based syllabus. Um, where language arises through need, um, not because it's been pre-prescribed. Okie dokie, I think that's me done. Have you got any questions? So at the moment, Fran, thank you ever so much for that amazing talk. It was really, really useful. Um, and unfortunately at the moment, we've got no questions. Um, if anyone in the room has any questions, please type them in the chat or the Q&A box now. Um, Oh, sorry, I've forgotten to put my video on again. Um, there I am. So, um, uh, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, please write them in the chat right now. Um, uh, while you're doing that, I just want to tell you about something exciting that's happening with Sensations English in the run-up to COP. Um, the Conference of Parties, the envir big environmental um, uh, meeting of, of the United Nations each year um, is happening, taking place um, from the from this week onwards for two weeks. And um, uh, one of the things that we like to do is provide thematic content around that. So what we have done, I can just show you, is collected um, a Padlet with lots of different resources that we have provided from our website. And I'll pop the link in the chat for you there as well. That's the link for the COP resource, COP28 resources. and. Um, there's a lot going on in this um, this meeting of COP. Uh, and as you can see, there's different um, information about COP that you can share with your students, um, information about Sensations English for you to um, be able to know how to navigate it yourself. Um, then different COP reports, which there are links to. Um, and uh, we've already got the fact that the temperatures are um, uh, are rising and actions not being taken. Um, there's other reports coming out in the next few weeks, um, in the next few days, in fact. Um, and then we've got some previous environmental reports here as well. So you can use them um, and access them and use them with your students as well. And, and some lesson plans which are coming. Um, the first one is coming tomorrow. Um, and, and so that then you can use these different teaching ideas with your students. Um, so just going back to the slides. You can also find information about everything in Sensations English on um, our social media as well. Um, but there are a couple of questions coming through, I think, now. Let me have a look. Oh, no, I think you've answered that in the frat, in, in, in the chat, um, Fran. Um, yeah. Do you want to say any more about that? Um, I just, so somebody asked, can could you reconstruct the sentences as homework so yeah i think that's a good question actually but i i would say because they don't have the the they're not doing it collaboratively then so they're not talking about language although obviously a lot goes on in their head even when they are reconstructing um i think it's not as valid because it's on their own and they don't have that opportunity for scaffolding um plus they might just cheat yeah. <laughs> 
think students find it actually fun. So I think working collaboratively adds to that. Um, yeah. I think it's some of the benefits of classroom time, isn't it? It's one of those things that yeah. the classroom actually brings um, this opportunity more than, you know, stuff that can be done remotely. Um, yeah. And, and so I, think, I think something I didn't mention, sorry, Adam, to interrupt, but when they're talking, you know, if they're struggling to talk about language, if they're, let's say they're, they're pre-intermediate level, um, or a week B1+, plus, then you, they can even do that in their first language because they're talking about language, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's negotiating that declarative procedural knowledge divide in that sense, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Well, Fran, thank you ever so much again. Um, that you. That leaves us, it's taken us exactly to the hour. So um, thank you very much for closing the 2023 monthly webinars that we've got because um, our next monthly webinar will come in January 2024 um, when we, be, we will be, be, be back discussing more different um, uh, types of learners and how to use rich, graded, authentic global resources with them. Um, but until then, have a happy holidays, happy end of the year, happy new year to you wherever you are. Um, and um, uh, thank you again, Fran, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.